Hello, and welcome to SLP Full Disclosure. I am your host, Jennifer Martin, and joining me is my spooky sidekick, (laughs) Jonathan Carey. Hello. So, I mean, but you can't really do the spooky thing because this is not going to be released until basically Thanksgiving, so. (laughs) Oh, well, that's not going to make sense then because, well, here it's the day after Halloween, so. Yeah. But I'm going to make it a season and not a day, so we can still keep your, and you're always spooky it doesn't matter <laughs> am i <laughs> i don't know about actually, that actually you're not so, yeah I, <laughs> I feel like i'm not so spooky no you're, you're spooky actually, you send I me spooky, spooky things so <laughs> I do. I like to disturb Jonathan with, um, he, he gets grossed out easily. So yeah, it's not my favorite thing in the world. So anytime I get a text message from you, I like squint before really looking at it, you know, it's like, is this questionable or not? Yeah. For those of you who remember the Guinness book of world records, I like to send him photos of the would you call them the winners? Yeah, the Guinness Book. Are they, are they winners? Some would consider them winners. Some would be losers. But <laughs> okay, the winner of the world record for the longest fingernails, and it really doesn't sit well with Jonathan. So Just even you saying that, I know it doesn't sit well. <laughs> <laughs> so now that I've realized, I've, I've there's it's amazing all the pictures you can find with similar <laughs> similar type photos. So yeah. But um, but yeah, so we've got a bit of a Halloween hangover. It's I, I I'm just going to put this out there before we move on because we have a really great <laughs> episode today. But I why can't Halloween be just the last Saturday of October every month every year? That's why? a good call. Or Friday might be even yes. better on a Friday. Well, but just it's this. I feel so bad for every school teacher today because it's Monday. Halloween well, was like, last night. And speaking of, Thanksgiving is always last Thursday. So, yeah, but then that's kind of nice because then you almost like can take off Friday and then you, you know, well, typically yeah, have I'm like a four there, day. There's a precedent for a holiday being on a certain day of the week, but not mm-hmm. necessarily a certain date. So, that's but. true. Well, I'm going to, I'm going to, um, put that on my list of <laughs> removing daylight savings. And, <laughs> okay, I'm um, all for that. That's coming then, up. Next weekend, and that's going to be brutal. Yes, it's, I know. I can't take it. But but what I can take <laughs> and what I am excited about and what you also, I could send you memes about and you would not be horrified, is our amazing guest today. Yeah, it was a jam-packed episode. So yeah. people people are going to be excited for this one. I know. I think she's a lot smarter than you and I combined. <laughs> I don't think anyone was questioning that. So. <laughs> <laughs> True, but uh, I just needed to put it out there. So <laughs> our guest today is Laura Baskell Smith, and I think you all are going to learn a ton from her. Um, but let me tell you a little bit about her first. She is a speech and language pathologist in Denver, Colorado, and she specializes in the assessment and intervention of children with childhood apraxia of speech at her private practice, which is called a mile high speech therapy. Prior to specializing in childhood apraxia of speech, she worked for 14 years as a school based speech and language pathologist. She is the mother to a child with apraxia and an author of the book, Overcoming Apraxia. Laura has written on childhood apraxia of speech in numerous publications and is often asked to give lectures and workshops nationally and internationally. A self-described fierce advocate, Laura spreads apraxia awareness and information on her social media handles under the name SLP Mommy of Apraxia. So we're so happy to have Laura here today. So welcome to you, Laura Smith. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks for having me. It is my pleasure. So you are, I I can't wait to get into all the things, but just so excited. (laughs) You have so many different titles. Um, You are a speech pathologist. (laughs) You are a published author. You are a parent. And, um, But before we get into all that and learn more about you and your expertise, I would just like to know what led you down this professional road and what led you to become a speech pathologist in the first place? 
<laughs> well, it's an interesting story, actually. Um, I was never going to be a speech language pathologist. That was never on the radar. What ended up happening is I went to college and I wanted to be a broadcast journalist because I love writing. And I'm in Denver. And so they said that to make it in broadcast journalism, journalism in Denver, I would have to transfer to a smaller town, build your resume to come back into a big market like Denver. And it was never in my... Um, you know, it's never what I wanted to do is to leave Colorado. My whole family's here and stuff. So I was like, okay, let's pick a different major. And so they said, well, what are you interested in? And I said, well, you know, I like writing, but I also like physical therapy because I used to play basketball and I had a trainer and stuff like that. So they married the two and sent me to speech communications. (laughs) And she had me take an intro to, um, you know, I think it was called language acquisition and I loved it. Like the English nerd in me and just grammar nerd in me and vocabulary, just it all, I loved it all. So what I decided to do is I would still, I would get my, the bachelor degree was speech communications and I would get my degree in that, but I was also working at a Dodge dealership at the time. And I fully expected to move up into Chrysler and run their customer relations department. (laughs) That was where I was at. So speech was there. It was interesting, but it was just a means to an end of getting my speech communications degree. So um, I got it. And then there was a recession and the car dealership was like, yeah, we're not going to give you a raise at all. So I was still going to be making $13 an hour with a bachelor degree. And I was like, oh my gosh, what am I going to do? And um, at the time, the three universities in Colorado had teamed together and gotten a grant for SLPA to see if this was something viable that could happen in our field. And I took the training because I got paid $3,000 as opposed to paying money to get a training. It's the only reason I did it. I was like, cool, I'm going to get paid money to take this training. Sure. Got my certificate. And then Denver Public Schools called right at the time I found out I wasn't going to get a raise at the Dodge dealership and said, do you want to interview? And the rest is history. Wow. So (laughs) there's so many things to unpack about that. Um, I I think, again, I just, we have so many new grads, people that haven't been out that long that really are not sure what direction they want to go in and what's, what sounds good to them. And so I just love these stories where sometimes you just have to wait, wait for different doors to open and walk through them. Um, yes. But I do also really love the creativity of the advisor of helping you marry those two physical therapy. Yeah. I mean, that was brilliant. What it wait uh, to really <laughs> like think outside of the box because that it did. It took two things you really loved and made one profession out of them. Yeah. Yeah. So when I had started in the schools as an SLPA, I had a mentor who was like, you're not going to grad school. I just don't understand. Why wouldn't you go to grad school? And I was like, I'm not going to grad school. I have to work. I can't afford to just take two years off and live off loans or whatever it is to get this degree. And she was pretty adamant. So she found by the end of that year, a graduate program that was a distant mm-hmm. learning program. Um, she had the application printed out for me because at that time you printed oh, stuff yeah, still. I, I I remember. <laughs> um, she had a letter of recommendation for me from her, the GRE date. Um, and it was all laying out to me with, in front of me when I got to work. And she was like, okay, at least I can say I did everything I could. And now it's up to you. And I was just looking at this, like, why does this woman believe in me this much? Like, I, I don't even know, like, how do I say no to this? So I said, you know what? I'm only applying to this one school. If it doesn't work out, it doesn't work out. And as you know, and many listeners know, usually graduate students apply Mm -hmm. for like 10, you know, eight to 10 on average. And so I only applied to that one and I got in and then my daughter has apraxia later on. And now I specialize in apraxia. So that is a very serendipitous journey. And actually it's a presentation I have for a college core, like a a 90 minute presentation to a college class. (laughs) Wow. Well, and, 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 and kudos to that woman. She did. She believed in you. It's like, (laughs) I'm not one of those people in my life. I mean, so you go to, yeah, that's, that's incredible. Um, what a, what a, a godsend she was. So then you finished grad school and what came first? And I I definitely want to talk about your daughter because like you mentioned, you are a parent of a child with apraxia, uh, your amazing daughter. And 
what led, what came first, the, your knowledge of apraxia, and then you end up having a daughter that has apraxia or the opposite? What, how did that happen? So I stayed in the schools after I got my degree because that's where I started. And I just kind of, you know, moved into an SLP role in the elementary schools. And that's where I stayed. Um, I graduated from grad school in 08. And then my daughter was born in 09. Mm. So um, by, you know, 2012, I knew that she had apraxia. So um, though I had had some trainings, I had taken one training as an SLPA in apraxia and just some peripheral, you know, trainings on it nothing really like deep. Um, yeah, by the time she was diagnosed with apraxia, no, I would not say like that is what catapulted me into the obsessiveness (laughs) that I had (laughs) to, um, get all of these, uh, continuing educations, uh, education credits around apraxia and how I ended up here in a private practice specializing in it now. Okay. So daughter first, then realizing, okay, I need to find out as much as I possibly can about this so that I can advocate for her, know what's best. So tell us about your amazing daughter. Cause I think this is such a, again, a serendipitous, um, story. So tell us about her. Yes. Yeah. So basically I knew she was delayed and in the schools, I preferred the severe needs programs. So I was always working with cerebral Mm -hmm. palsy type, you know, um, disorders and things like that was kind of my jam. And so I really suspected cerebral palsy in her, which she also does have, but it's a very rare presentation and no one identified it until she was eight. So that's a whole nother story altogether, but she did actually have it. And that's kind of where I was going. Like she's low tone, she's delayed globally. What is going on here? You know? Um, and And I I just, yeah, worked with her almost every night until, you know, between the ages of two and three. And then right before she turned three, I took her into Child Find, knowing that she would Mm -hmm. qualify for an IEP. And that's when that um, SLP said, Laura, this is apraxia. Like, just very matter-of-factly, almost like it was so obvious like yeah. to her that how did I miss it type. But I, I mean, I don't hold anything against her, just like, Laura, you know, and it hit me like a ton of bricks simply because everything made sense. Why everything I was doing wasn't working, why she remained to have, you know, mm-hmm. be so significantly delayed d- in spite having speech therapy, seemingly literally every <laughs> single night I came home from work and just making so minimal progress. So, uh, yeah. Um, Yeah. So basically, I mean, that was actually a very dark time in my life. Like, um, you know, you go to work and you're, you help kids speak and then you come home to the one kid in the universe that means the most to you and you seemingly can't help them talk and you're supposed to be a speech language pathologist. So, um, professionally, my self-esteem was low, you know, parentally I was grieving and, um, it was just really hard. But, um, after I got through that, I decided, as you said, um, to choose to look at things, um, as a serendipitous type, um, situation. So I said, this had to have happened for a reason and not for negative. So I'm going to turn it into a positive and I have the ability to take all of these credits where other parents don't. I have the ability to go to every single training I can find on apraxia and then not only have the ability to take the training, but the ability to implement it. So, um, that's what I did. And yeah. (laughs) And did you find that in, in during the course of this, which and, and, and as a fellow parent, you know, I'm sitting here thinking what that might feel like, and and I think it's a good reminder for a couple of things: is that one, sometimes when we're in a situation, you know, it's that it's really hard to see outside of where we're at, and so therefore, I yeah, yes. other professionals coming in to help us and help us see things that we might not see, I think is so important because yeah, especially if it's personal to us, it's sometimes really hard to see that. So, um, did you, and and also just as a parent, I mean, I, I can imagine that that just felt very, very difficult and gut wrenching because you're right. You, you almost know too much. And I'm sure that was a yeah. really scary feeling because it's like, oh, well, yes. what is not a big deal. This isn't a big deal, but you probably are thinking, oh gosh, I know. And yes. that probably didn't help either. Yeah, I describe in my book this moment where um, pretty much after the SLP said that, I don't remember anything else that was said. 
Um, all I could think about was apraxia, lifelong, neurological. Oh my gosh, she's going to have to work so hard. Oh my gosh, she's going to have to have all this therapy. Oh my gosh, is she going to speak when she's an adult? Like that's all the stuff that was going through my head. Anything else anyone ever, anything said after that, <laughs> I did not catch. Um, so I held it together during that evaluation and then we go outside and at the time, um, the only word she had was hi, mm-hmm. pretty much that she could say on demand. And she said it like with a bunch of intonations and in a bunch of, a bunch of different situations. And she could change her intonation depending on what she wanted to mm-hmm. convey, like what message she wanted to convey. And so I remember I'm like in this haze, I'm walking out of the building, I'm like buckling her into her car seat. And now I can finally start crying. So I'm crying. And well, I mean, I could have cried then too, yeah. but you try and hold it together. And uh, so I'm crying and I'm putting her in her car seat. And like what broke my haze was this like, Hi. Oh. <laughs> I know. Which made me cry more. <laughs> You're like, oh. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, she knew. <laughs> she knew mama was sad. Um, yeah. <laughs> well, and I also think that that is such a good reminder. What you say as well is that so many times as SLPs, we are delivering a diagnosis that's difficult or give, sharing news that's hard for a parent or caregiver to hear. And then we continue to, well, and then this, and then it means this, but I think it's right. such a good <laughs> reminder what you just said, where you heard that and then everything else just kind of stopped. You weren't, you were no longer mm-hmm. taking in information. And so that's also a great reminder. Yeah. And I'm thinking even just for myself to remember to give people a little bit of time and space to process before we start just piling on all this information that's probably not going to be retained anyway. I mean, what I do now as um, a practicing clinician is just say, you know, I'll give, I'll go through, typically what I do is I list the characteristics. Mm-hmm. I say, to get a diagnosis of apraxia, your child needs to have demonstrated during this evaluation, mm-hmm. we kind of go through it. We look at the chart first. It already speaks for itself without me mm-hmm. saying, you know, to meet the criteria, this is what you have. And it's clear the child has met the criteria. And that's when I say, you know, this is childhood apraxia of speech. And then I wait and I just say... Do you have any questions? Like, mm-hmm. what can I, what can I answer? Because yeah, pretty much after that, I don't, it, it's just, there, I, there are parents who, um, there is one other type of parent aside from the grieving parent, like I was, which is the relieved mm-hmm. parent. So the journey to find or to get an apraxia diagnosis from someone who is competent mm-hmm. and who is able to do so is so lengthy for some parents. Um, like literally just this past two weeks, I've had someone come up from New Mexico and I've had another person from, where were they from? Uh, I feel like Wyoming, but both of them came just mm-hmm. to get the differential diagnosis. So yes, there was grief, but it was more relief. Yeah, no, that's a great point because some, you know, as a parent, something's not right. And even though it's hard to hear, it's like something I can yes. at least then, then we can yes. have a place to start from to, yes. to work towards goals. But if you don't know, it's really hard. Well, yes. and so I really want to talk. So it, uh, quick before I move on, how is your daughter doing now? What grade is she in? <laughs> yeah, so she is um, 12. She just turned 12 October 20th. So she's very excited mm. to be a tween. <laughs> um, <laughs> and uh, she is in sixth grade. Mm. So this is her first year of middle school. And in terms of, you know, she has other things um, other than apraxia. So she really is like a little case study for SLPs. I mean, she has apraxia, dysarthria, and developmental language disorder, and dysphagia, and a myofunctional disorder. So <laughs> she's got it all if you want to take a look at her. Um, I've definitely learned a lot from her, but she's very intelligible. So um, probably in fourth grade, I think the SLP had listed 98% intelligible across <laughs> context and unknown um, communicators. Wow. So. Yeah. So I think that, you know, it doesn't mean Mm -hmm. her speech is perfect. She certainly has a lot of times where she slurs things, um, but that's usually caused by dysarthria. Mm -hmm. Um, In terms of apraxia, though, it's mostly uh, we would consider it clinically as resolved, even though there's controversy with Mm -hmm. that term, because it never truly gets resolved. You will always have it lifelong. Well, that is wonderful to hear. That is quite the success story uh, because I know it, it doesn't always turn out that way. We'll be right back to our interview. Take a moment to stretch your legs, but don't go anywhere because we want to talk to you about our podcast partner, Med Travelers. Med Travelers is an industry leader in allied travel career opportunities for a reason. Featuring exclusive jobs at top tier facilities across the United States, higher earning potential, W 2 employee status, and a flexible schedule, Med Travelers is your advocate for career success. 
Make sure to visit medtravelers.com to discover how med travelers can help drive your career forward. Again, go to medtravelers.com to start your travel journey today. And now back to the show. I'm so glad you're here for many reasons. Um, but just as you had already stated, this is a really, I, I feel like this is an area, of course, in grad school, we all learn about, we talk about, but it's really hard to get good experience with child apraxia yeah. speech. And and oftentimes, I mean, I can think, honestly, I've had, I think, two kids that were, we knew, and I know that there, there are kids that, and this is years ago, that I want to find and apologize to because it was like, I oh, just, we all I have know, those kids. and it's just one where... I, I didn't know what I didn't know. And I know that yeah. I was, in hindsight, was not, I did not, um, I was not the best person to work with them, but because I just didn't have that experience. So just to get started, how do you define a praxia of speech? So a praxia is the difficulty planning and programming the movements needed for speech. And it really takes a whole mind shift for us as speech language pathologists, because we are really, really good at looking at sound, you know, um, omissions, sound substitutions, and remediating and fixing those. Like, that is what we are good at. But the problem is, even if a child is substituting a sound for another sound when they have childhood apraxia speech, likely the problem, unless they have a phonological disorder with it, which can happen, but likely the problem initially is in speech motor planning. Mm -hmm. And so the problem is the brain telling the articulators mm -hmm. and the muscles planning the movements for what to do. So it's first we have to plan mm -hmm. the movements and then we have to give the message to the articulators to do that. So it all starts in the brain. And so if we're so focused on execution and at the sound level, we make very minimal progress because we have not achieved true motor learning, mm -hmm. which is the movements and the sequences of the speech sound. So it's almost that we, we move ahead too quickly. We're not starting at the root. As, you're, as exactly. you're saying this, I'm thinking it's almost like executive functioning for our speech. Yeah, it's <laughs> very similar because there is in apraxia, if you um, are an SLP and you've been in those IEP meetings with OTs, what do OTs say all the time? Oh, they have a problem with motor mm -hmm. initiation and motor planning and initiation and planning all mm -hmm. starts in the brain, executive functioning, very similar. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, I feel like, well, not unfortunately, but as it is, it is, um, a lot of neurodivergent children mm -hmm. tend to have executive functioning as a common comorbidity to what Whatever, you know, disability they have, whether it be dyslexia, ADHD, mm -hmm. apraxia, you know, so. And do they know what causes apraxia? We have three main causes. The most common is idiopathic, meaning yeah. we just really don't know. Um, but two other causes are um, some sort of neurodevelopmental disorder where there might be some sort of brain insult like stroke in mm. utero or stroke after. Or even if there's a head injury in childhood, we're still going to call it childhood apraxia of speech because the child's brain is still developing. Mm. So we're not going to, it's not going to be the same as your adult who had a stroke or had a TBI because um, the brain, you know, I, you know, has, is not in childhood essentially. So um, that would be one cause. You can also have like a metabolic disorder that kind of falls under mm -hmm. that. Um, that's pretty rare. Um, and then the other one is genetic. So Ashlyn's is genetic. She has a mutation on this gene called BCL11A, and it's the cause of all of the disabilities that she has. So. Oh, that's fascinating. Um, I did mm -hmm. not know a lot of that. So it sounds like it's something you can be born with, but it's also something you can acquire. Yep. Okay. And it can be heritable or de novo. So heritable is like like if Ashlyn were to have children mm -hmm. now, there's a high potential for it to be a heritable problem now, that it's heritable because she has the mutation. In Ashlyn's case, it was de novo, meaning it just was this random event that occurred at conception. So it was just this random mutation, de novo, um, not heritable. But now it becomes heritable that she ha can be, that she has it. Oh my gosh. I feel like we could go down an entire rabbit hole of... Uh, of just you genetics. can. It's a whole talk. Well, I, it's a whole <laughs> workshop. <laughs> well, and I, you know, I'm just fascinated by genetics and how all this works. And Me so too. it's like, okay, I'm going to contain myself. We will talk about this another time because we are talking about a proxy right now. But, uh, but I just learned a lot. I think I just learned more from you right now than I learned all of my grad school about a proxy. Yay! <laughs> so, That's my goal, baby. So thank you for that. Um, and so just for those listening, let's say, 
say even if you're a parent or you're working with with young students or um, early intervention, what would you say are those initial signs of apraxia that really are kind of the ding to you know pay attention to? Yeah. So interestingly enough, I feel like this was one of my uh, soapboxes early on because I was mostly an elementary school mm-hmm. provider as I, well, I was, that was all I was. <laughs> I mean, maybe I had some three-year-olds or preschools rarely, you know, but it was in the elementary school. So I really did not know that there were signs and characteristics of apraxia early mm-hmm. on. And, um, you know, it, it did, it did make me probably more passionate to be like, we need to know this stuff. Like, this is unbelievable that I didn't know this. And, you know, not just me, but SLPs in general are good students. Like if you have SLPs listening, you all know we have to have a high GPA to even get considered getting into grad school. I mean, it's crazy. Like we are good students. You don't just skate by with a C degree getting your master's in speech pathology. It does not work like that. And so I'm like, here I was a good student. I did the very best I could. And I missed apraxia in my own daughter. And I have a graduate degree. I went to school for, you know, six years to miss apraxia in my own daughter in the field. Like I was just, it was maddening to me. So anyway, I will calm down and get back to the characteristics and signs in children. So definitely um, a lack of babbling. I do remember learning in language acquisition that people, that people, that Mm -hmm. babies babbled. I did not realize a lack of babbling could be indicative of a motor planning or speech disorder or develop language language disorder later on. So um, at six months, we expect a child to have canonical babbling, mama, 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 Mm -hmm. like that, or da, da, da. Um, And Ashlyn didn't have that. She cooed and was very like vocal in that sense. I felt like she was super communicative, but not with consonants. Um, and then by nine months, we expect that to be variegated. So they should be mm-hmm. changing their consonants and vowels, sounding more like jargon, ma da ga da da da, you know, something like that. Definitely didn't have that. So in case histories, not only do we ask the parents what the um, babbling looked like, but we really um, ask more deeply what it looked like because a lot of parents might think their child was vocal because they cooed, but when you delve deeper, maybe they had canonical but not variegated. And so that is very telling. Um, we did get some new research out in 2019, which was exciting. It was a retrospective video study where um, they looked at videos of infants, of children who had been diagnosed later on with childhood apraxia speech. And what they found was um, pretty much like a lack of a consonant by a year mm-hmm. was um, a characteristic. And that would be true of Ashlyn. She had high. So, I mean, could we count H as a consonant? I mean, yes, but not, I mean, not, you know, like, so it's just really interesting. And then by 15 months, a lack of three consonants consonants by 15 months, lack of velars, not really saying any velars. I think that one is a fascinating one. And, um, uh, yeah, so that was part of the research with the, you know, in terms of the volubility of the consonants. Um, but other things I see in the case history are pop-out words. Um, yeah, these are words heard uh, maybe once or for a short time and then not heard again. So I remember Ash and I have her on video even saying burp, and I thought it was so funny. And, um, Anyway, I never got it after that video. Never again. Well, I mean, again, but after she learned how to talk with intensive speech therapy, you know. So that's reported commonly. And another common report is kind of a go-to sound or word that they'll say for everything. So Ashlyn's was a da. She just said that for everything. It was easy to, you know, to say that for her. Um, but that's frequently reported. I just evaluated a kid a couple months ago, and his was a new one for me. But his was Inga, oh, <laughs> which does have a velar, you know. So that kind of you know, not all of these are yeah. going to be set in stones. So that's important to realize too. So his go-to was a mm-hmm. velar, um, but it was very limited, just this one kind of consonant. So, Well, and as you're talking through these, these signs, I'm thinking this probably doesn't help when to get an appropriate diagnosis, diagnosis because so many of these things you can attribute to other things. So yeah. it would be very yeah, easy to overlap. say, oh, well, it's this. Or I'm thinking a lot of those are things for a diagnosis of autism, where it's like, mm-hmm. you know, they'll say something and then you won't hear it again, or lack of babbling. Mm-hmm. And so, mm-hmm. and in, in, when you were in that time with her as six months, nine months, do you remember feeling at that time, oh, she should be doing this? Or was it truly not something until after the fact where you thought, 
gosh, now that I think back, she wasn't. Or did you at the time think, you know what? She should be doing this by now. Always thought okay. she should be doing so this. So you you mm-hmm. were aware. Because I'm thinking, you know, you're tired when you have a baby. And so I could easily imagine even myself being like, well, gosh, I didn't realize at the time until afterwards. But yeah. Well, the caveat being, I always knew she was mm-hmm. behind, but I didn't realize it could be something yeah. so serious as a apraxia. Yeah. So yeah, did I think she had a speech delay? Of yeah. course. Like, did I think it was serious? Not really. I mean, the cerebral palsy, certainly a lot of children I knew, you know, cerebral palsy has a lot of times dysarthria. Mm-hmm. So I was definitely expecting maybe delayed slurred speech, um, but not apraxia. Like that definitely was not on my radar anywhere at all. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And that's what makes me mad, <laughs> that it wasn't on my radar at all. I know. It, yeah. That it yeah. is, uh, I mean, that's a whole nother conversation I have. So, but, but I, I'm sure I, I'm sure you're, uh, have come to terms with it, but do not beat yourself up over that because, you know, we, we can't know all of it. And especially sometimes we're just, when we're thinking it's one thing, it's really hard to get our mind to think that, oh my gosh, I couldn't, wouldn't have ever thought it was this. So, um, yeah. And, So one of the things that I remember vividly from grad school is learning is that one of the signs is they're not able to imitate. They can't repeat, imitate whether it's a motor movement or a a speech sound. Is that antiquated information or is that still? Not necessarily. Um, I feel like that was probably more information than I got. Um, I was told apraxia was so rare. Don't worry about it. You'll never see it. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Luckily, you got at least that information, even if it was antiquated. It's only antiquated in the sense that now, you know, apraxia, childhood apraxia speech was only recognized by ASHA officially in 2007. Oh, wow. So if you think about that, yeah, that has not been a really long time. Now, that doesn't mean it didn't Mm -hmm. exist. It just meant different clinicians had their own, you know, Mm -hmm. diagnostic criteria for diagnosing it. Same with researchers and people called it different things. So ASHA finally just got it officially recognized with a streamlined set of characteristics in 2007. And if we're really only talking about childhood apraxia speech, you know, um, purely, then we're really only talking about speech. You know, everything else can be related. So certainly, um, like in Ashlyn's case, she does have developmental uh, uh, coordination disorder or dyspraxia, aka dyspraxia, aka OT say motor planning in the schools. (laughs) So it's actually called something instead of motor planning. It's developmental coordination disorder. And if the child has difficulty difficulty imitating wheels mm-hmm. on the bus or open shut them or those gestural um, kind of movements, then we are even more suspect that the cause of their speech delay mm-hmm. is um, motor planning for speech. So yeah, it just is such a great reminder too, that we don't all like, you know, the SLP is not in their silo OT. Like there's just so much overlap. It really, yeah. and especially with the yeah. brain, because it, there really is so totally. much. Um, totally. I mean, anything with the brain is a, a very unlikely to occur in just this yes. isolated system of the yes. body. Like <laughs> when it's right the control here, center. right here. And it's only yeah. affecting right here. <laughs> right. No, it does not. It doesn't <laughs> right. work that way. Um, anyone who's worked right. at TBI, you know, it doesn't work that way. Yes. Yes. And I know. when would you say now that you know, specialize in, in apraxia, about what age are most kids going to get a diagnosis? So it's a loaded question. If we're going to talk about kids who don't have comorbidities, Mm -hmm. but probably are just, you know, dealing and not just, but if the the main cause of the speech disorder is mm-hmm. apraxia with no other, you know, major comorbidities like Down syndrome, autism, fragile X. Those kids are most likely going to be diagnosed around three. Okay. Like if I'm going to make a broad sweeping generalization. Um, unfortunately, though, you can definitely have the child has to be verbal enough or at mm-hmm. least imitative enough to participate in what we call a dynamic motor speech exam where we're requiring them to at least attempt to imitate a variety of syllables syllables and words that we're giving them so we can make the case for the criteria needed to give an apraxia diagnosis. So um, if a child is not able to participate in that, it's not over. We can give a um, provisionary provisional label of like suspected mm-hmm. apraxia and still treat it, you know, like that. Um, but by and large, yeah, I would say it's around three. You can have kids diagnosed before you can have di- kids diagnosed after. And then of course, much later, but you would hate to have that. Cause that would be, yeah. But, yes. You would hate yeah, to have that. It does. I'm sure it happens, but well, and yes. tell me a little bit more about the assessment process. I'd love to know what do you, what do you feel like is the best way to assess, um, 
to see if if, if you have suspicions that, that apraxia is at play. Yeah. So um, we, you know, generally an SLP is still going to want to be giving their standardized assessment. So whatever you use is, you know, is fine. So whether you have the Goldman Fristo or I, I tend to use like, because I'm in the field and because I specialize this in this, I use something called the, um, it's called the DEEP. Of course, it's going to elude me what it stands for. Diagnostic um, Evaluation of Articulation and Phonology. Yeah, there we right. go. Um, <laughs> yeah. You got it. And the reason I got it. Um, and the reason I like it is because not only does it have just the standardized assessment that we need to get that standard, you know, kind of score, norm norm reference score. Um, but it also has a bunch of criterion referenced in it. So it has an oral motor screen. That's just a criterion reference, but still I find it helpful. It screens for um, something called oral apraxia, which can occur alongside verbal apraxia or may not. But if it does occur, then the cause of the speech problem is even more likely to be verbal apraxia. So oral apraxia is difficulty with any non-speech oral motor mo movement. So like puckering, mm -hmm. retracting, um, licking the lips, um, going side to side, up and down, things like that. So if a child is struggling to do that, minus phonation and respiration, <laughs> once you add phonation and respiration on top, it's most likely going to be verbal apraxia. But so it has a screen for that, which I like. And then it also has something called an inconsistency test where um, one of the if we're going to talk about diagnostic criteria, ASHA outlines what's called the ASHA-3. Mm -hmm. And the very first one is inconsistent errors on repeated productions of words. So um, we have to show that it's called a token-to-token -token inconsistency, that when a child says a word that's in their zone of proximal development, let's say they can say three-syllable words and you give them Thai or me and they say it consistently, that's not a motor speech exam for that child. We need to be maxing and taxing their motor speech mm -hmm. exam. So... Um, if we see inconsistent errors in multisyllabic words or whatever their zone of proximal development is, um, that, you know, satisfies the first criteria of the ASHA-3 of inconsistent errors. So I like the test because it has that. Um, but ultimately, you are going to give a standardized assessment and kind of see where they're at, you know, um, in terms of standardized scoring. But then you're also going to look at... Um, criteria relate and, and criteria related to apraxia. So um, we have inconsistent errors like I talked about. The second one would be difficulty with coarticulatory like configurations that are lengthened. So basically a fancy term just meaning as the syllables or phrase or sentence levels get longer, they start getting more intelligible. So um, you know a kid with Fano, let's say he says elephant, elephant. And that's just how he says it. It's not going to change. Or let's say he says, you know, elephant. Let's say he even does that. But then if he goes into a sentence, the sentence is still probably going to be, I saw an elephant. But with apraxia, it's going to be harder. They're not going to maintain the integrity of the, the multisyllabic word most likely. And so most likely you're going to see it be like, I saw an elephant. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden it's like, oop, where'd that go? Where'd all those sounds go? But a kid with Fano is not likely to do that. You know, if that's their representation gotcha. of elephant, it is in a phrase or a sentence or conversation. That's just how they say it. So not true with apraxia. And then the third criteria is some sort of prosodic disruption. So typically what we see is equal syllabic stress or some sort of syllable, seg what we call segregation. So think about um, like if I have a kid say a multisyllabic word like elephant, you know, it's like elephant. We're, stretchy, we're stressing that first mm -hmm. syllable. Kids with apraxia might tend, in order to get all of the motor plan, all of the sounds, they might, they tend to have a tendency to be like elephant and make it very robotic sounding, staccato sounding. Um that's the most typical that I see, but definitely if they have, you know, um, variations with intonation, um, volume can be another one. <laughs> They're unable to modulate or vary their volume and, um, yeah, things like that. So those are the ASHA three. Those are the must haves. So you're going to do a standardized assessment and then other things to help you look for those um, characteristics, which is where that dynamic motor speech exam mm -hmm. comes in, where you really are coming up with it's individual to the child because it's going to be individual on what they're actually saying. And so you're going to have them try and repeat, um, you know, words of varying uh, lengths to, to see if you can, um, identify these characteristics. So it's a pretty, um, 
robust <laughs> assessment process. I mean, it sounds like it really it <laughs> looks at, which is, which is important. I think that's something really important for us to remember is that it needs to be to really, because it's a, it's a big diagnosis. And so it you is. do want to make sure you're checking all those boxes and, and you, do you feel like maybe even half the time you're doing informal assessment along with formal just to really see what it looks like in action when they're not going through a formal assessment? Yeah, I would say most of the time it's going to be informal because of the dynamic nature of the assessment. So um, research now, like researchers who are currently studying apraxia um, tend to take the ASHA-3 one step further. So they, um, there's some uh, debate that the ASHA-3 overdiagnoses children. Mm -hmm. And so um, current researchers right now are looking at, we want to see at least four characteristics of apraxia um, across three speech tasks. And so um, different characteristics, kind of, if we're thinking down this, you know, mm-hmm. going down a left column, we definitely would have like inconsistent errors, difficulty with coarticulatory transitions, prosodic errors. But then you also have things like vowel errors, syllable segregation, groping. Um, there's other characteristic that we can look at. And then we're doing three speech tasks. So one speech task might be your standardized assessment. Another speech task might be the um, oral motor screen that I mm-hmm. talked about. But in that screen, they also have a modified. DDK, um, diodocokinetic rate. And so a modified for a kid looks like patty yeah. cake instead of puttica. <laughs> and so we look at their ability to be like patty cake, patty cake, patty cake. And um, it rates, you know, gives you different ratings. So um, a modified DDK might be a speech task. And then the other one that I'm obsessed with is a 2017 article by Dr. Yuzini Siegel, who is going to be a pioneer in this field for sure. Love her. Um, but in 2017, she um, proposed that this phrase called called by Bobby a puppy when repeated five times um, would be specific enough to help um, discriminate kids who have speech delay versus apraxia. Mm. And um, so again, it's not one task that diagnose apraxia, but when you add it to the body of evidence, um, this particular pr- phrase by Bobby a puppy, another characteristic is voicing errors. Mm. Um, so it's very unusual. You might have a kid with phonological disorder who just has a consistent pattern of voicing error, but with apraxia, these tend to be very inconsistent patterns of voicing errors and having the B to the P change um, to Tends to be very challenging for kids with apraxia and motor planning. Wow. Sounds like uh, the key word for uh, so much of this is inconsistency. And that should be when you're noticing that as a clinician, that should be it or a parent, that should be an instant, okay, I need to look further into this because it, it sounds like that, that should cue you that there may be something else going on. Inconsistency to me is one of the biggest red flags. Depending on who you have on that this podcast, that would be debatable. Mm. There certainly are people who don't think that um, inconsistent. And it's mm-hmm. true. You don't necessarily need to have proven inconsistent errors as long as you can prove that there are four other mm. characteristics of apraxia gotcha. across three speech tests. A child can still get a diagnosis of apraxia. But for me, certainly, mm. I feel like inconsistent errors and actually along with vowel errors, are, which aren't in the ASHA 3, for me personally, when I see those two, I'm like, oh, baby. Well, and you've done this long enough and seen enough kids that you do yeah. start to notice pa- <laughs> right, patterns. Right, exactly. It's, it's, patterns, it, it's exactly. not like you're pulling this out of thin air. You, you've seen it enough mm-hmm. where it's like, okay, this. I've seen it enough that it means something. Um, yeah. Another big one for me that's not anywhere that I can find, but just mm-hmm. known if you do this is glottal stops. So um, if I have a kid, like let's say a therapist will identify a child has final consonant deletion and they believe it's a phonological disorder because they see a pattern mm-hmm. of missing fine consonants, but a child with apraxia might have a tendency to mark it with a glottal stop. So they're actually marking the consonant, but it's not being counted because it's a glottal stop. So an example would be like, if I go to say hat, I say hat. And I'm doing it with my glottal. Mm. Or if I say muddy, I'm like, muddy. Mm. And they do it with their glottal stop. They're marking the consonant, but just not appropriately. Oh, wow. <laughs> and so it's not a phonological disorder where a therapist who is un- like who is just used to looking at the patterns is like, yep, they're missing all their final consonants. No, actually they're not. They're marking it, but it's a glottal stop. So I'll see that a lot too. Oh, great call out because that's something I'm sure that if you don't know what you don't know. And now 
You really don't. Yeah. I mean, you can't yeah. blame anyone. This is what we're trained to do is look at phonological yeah. patterns and articulation substitutions. So yeah. And sometimes we just aren't seeing yeah. what we, we don't know to look for. So I'm so glad that you pointed yes, that 100%. out. And I'm curious <laughs> as well, just even from your own daughter's experience and all the, the children you've worked with, do they know that they're not producing it the way that you are or in their mind? I mean, what, I, I'm just curious about what their experience is. Is it, is it like you want to, to, let's say if I want to move my arm and I'm saying th- like, tr- like I want to move my arm, I want to move my arm and my arm's not moving. Is it that mm-hmm. feeling or do they think they're saying it the way you're saying it, but they're not? So I would say it depends on cognitive level, age, which goes Mm -hmm. along with cognitive level, and then also if there's some sort of um, auditory discrimination problem, Mm. um, which you can have too. And so it can run the gamut. So certainly a person who has um, some difficulties with auditory perceptual tasks, um, which you can have if you have apraxia, um, that person is going to struggle more with hearing the difference in themselves. Mm. So those will be the kids who cognitively are... you know, right on, on par. And they will tell me, I feel like I'm saying that I'm saying that. And I'm like, I know you think you're saying that honey. Like I know. And you're not the only person that tells me this, but your parents have brought you to see me because you're actually not saying that. And I really go back and forth between, um, putting them on video Mm -hmm. and having them hear themselves. Cause that would seem like the next step, right? Like, Oh, we'll just video record them. But on an apraxia awareness day, a couple of years back, a girl from Canada, who's a young adult now described her therapist doing that and how absolutely devastated and embarrassed it made her. So then I was like, oh, like obviously the SLP did not want that to happen. She was just trying to show her like, no, this is how you're talking. But so now I really try not to do that and just tell them like, your parents brought you here to me. And I know that you think you're saying it this way, but this is what we're actually hearing. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I need to help you say it this way. So that's the kind of approach I try to take now. Um, But then you definitely have children who are unaware and they're perfectly fine with just having you tell them how to say it right. (laughs) They're like, okay, I'll do whatever you say, whatever you want, Miss Laura, you know. So Um, you say so, lady. I think I'm fine, but whatever. Yeah, yeah, (laughs) Yeah, exactly. Um, And then as they get older, adults will start to recognize that they have said something Mm. wrong. Um, So this is fascinating to me. I'm going to just take a brief deviation. But um, clinically, what looks like word finding to me can actually be what's called in like adults call it an apraxic moment. Mm. So clinically, we can't get inside their head and know if they truly had a word finding problem or if they were having a hard time motor planning the word. To me, clinically, it looks like a word finding issue. Um, but when I talk to young adults, cause I've done some panels now with apraxia to them, it's a motor planning problem. And I'll give you an example. Let's say they meet someone and you just can't place their, their name. That's a true word finding problem. The file cabinet is there. They can't open the, the, the file to access what that word is. That is word finding. But, um, when I was talking to this one young man, he was talking about going through the Starbucks drive through and how he always used to order an iced coffee, but he wanted a nitro brew and and iced coffee came out and he knew he wanted nitro brew, but he could not access like he, he, he had the access. Oh. The file was open. Nitro brew is there, but he could not get <laughs> nitro brew out. Isn't that fascinating? And there is no way clinically you or I would ever know that that is what's going on. And so now that I've talked to these young adults, Ashlyn the other day, and remember she's Mm -hmm. 12, we, and and these things happen periodically, but we were um, walking to school and she saw a crab apple tree and there were apples on the ground. And she was like, oh my gosh, look, mom, there's, I, and then she looks confused and she's like, I, and she looks confused and she's like, I, And she looks confused and she's like, apples. And she's like, apples. I, I, why am I doing that? Apples. That is not word finding. The word was there. The cabinet was open. It's motor planning the movements of the sounds to get the word out. And I was just talking to that young man with the Starbucks and I told him, oh my gosh, I think this just happened to Ashlyn. And I was like, you know, clinically, there's no way to write it except word finding. That is word finding clinically. And he's like, well, maybe you could just put, and obviously I'm not an SLP, but that what looks like word finding could be, you know, difficulties, um, you know, with uh, apraxia interfering with the ability to, um, you know, program and plan the word. (laughs) 
that interesting? That is so interesting because I've been I know most of the time it's just my file cabinets not open. <laughs> Yes, yes, that is what it looks and, and like. I can't imagine how frustrating. So I'm so much of what when you're talking about their experience of these these kids, and even as they get older, it feels like it would be so frustrating. I mean, if you're sitting yes. there saying, "I know the word, I have the word," it's just not yes. coming out of my mouth, and now I'm yes. going to get an iced coffee and not the nitro brew I wanted, yeah, because I couldn't get it to come out of my mouth. Yes, it is. It's very much like stuttering to me. Um, and it like what, you know, is in the stuttering literature. And I feel like I'm excited for the new wave of research to show that um, this is a thing with apraxia too, because what that also does is build anxiety yes. similar to stuttering. And when you have anxiety and you're worried, you're not going to be able to get the word out for whatever reason, whether it's word finding, which can still happen with apraxia or whether it's an apraxic moment, um, anxiety builds and um, that confounds the problem. Yeah, that is really, I'm, thank you for sharing that because I do think that that is quite interesting as well. And then it's one of those where, what do you do about it? Because yeah. it's like, it's there, but... So similar to stuttering, we have to teach these kids to advocate mm. for themselves. Yeah. You know, because that is something that's always going to be with them and um, expecting them to just as expecting to remediate a lifelong neurological disorder is the wrong expectation. So we want to get them as good as we can. We always want everyone to improve no matter what area you're trying to improve into the best of your ability. But if you are still having difficulties, then you have to be able to advocate for yourself, whatever area of life that might be. That is such an important call out. I'm so glad you said that because I, I, I'm so focused on thinking about how do we assess? How do we treat? But you're right. There is a certain point where as much as everybody wants it to be fixed, well, you're fixed. Right. It's done. Right. Um, it's right. not. And so you're right, right. That, that advocating for yourself is, is going to have to be part of your strategy for life. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Yep. And he said too, like, it's more socially acceptable to say, I need a moment as opposed to, hold on a second, I can't get the word out. <laughs> it's like, it's funny. We can laugh about it, but man, like it's a thing. I, I need to start using that when I'm having my, because my, again, my file cabinet's open. I just, I, I can't find the word. I always remind myself that what somebody told me years ago is that, okay, no, typical word finding is, I can't remember the name of this. And but, but, mm-hmm. or I should say like word finding is cognition memory is I can't mm-hmm. remember mm-hmm. the name of this, but atypical is I can't remember what this does. So it's like, what mm, I can't, I can't remember the name of this. Oh, it's my toothbrush. What does this do? <laughs> Yeah. (laughs) You know, circumlocution, which I think is funny, it can be a powerful strategy to help word finding in our kids with apraxia. And parents always ask me like, oh, is it a bad thing? And I'm like, so no, it's not a bad thing. It's interesting when you're in SLP to teach circumlocution when you were taught circumlocution is a speech language problem. (laughs) You know what I mean? When you see circumlocution. Yes. And so that's the thing that it's hard to explain to parents. But yes, like when you're going through speech pathology, and you assess kids and they are circumlocuting all over the place, you're like, oh man, poor baby. Like this is an expressive language disorder. You have a kid with apraxia. You're like, okay, let me teach you how to (laughs) circumlocute so you can get your point across when you can't access the word or motor plan the word. And that's another reason why it's so important to get the correct diagnosis because you could be teaching something that's going to be completely ineffective because it's their it's being thought they have this and not this. So that's yes, totally. so important. Well, I want to move into treatment and what, the, and I know that this is, you do, you do public speaking. This is probably a two day course or longer on treatment. So by <laughs> no means is this going to cover everything, but just generally when you're, when you're planning those treatment sessions, what, what does that look like as far as, you know, frequency, um, how do you begin? Is it immediate parent involvement? So some of that, what, what are your thoughts on treatment? If I can impart something to listeners in the few in the few moments that I have to get across what I'd like to see for treatment, it is the principles of motor learning. And I wish that we were taught the principles of motor learning in graduate school. And I don't know anyone who is unless they have a professor who specializes in apraxia. But if we were taught the principles of motor learning, our practice across the board, 
grammar, expressive language, everything would be so much more effective and phonology and so much better. It really would. And, um, you know, I think we're getting there, but essentially the crux of principles of motor learning is that speech is a motor skill, at least especially for apraxia. Okay. I'm not saying don't use your phono approaches for phonological disorder. I'm just saying if speech is a motor act, what we do is, um, we have very specific practice schedules and first we get acquisition and then we need to get carryover. So in our therapy room, acquisition doesn't just end. We all know those kids who perform in our therapy room and leave the door and it's all Mm -hmm. gone. With motor learning, there is a specific and strategic plan for that carryover to happen. And it, it it all falls into the principles of motor learning that is the workshop. So, um, you know, basically we need to get, um, to maximize principles of motor learning. We need to have a high amount of practice reps. Um, when I give my workshops, like there's this one research article that shows in Fano approaches when they did a study, um, SLPs were getting around 30 to 60 reps per session for apraxia. We're up to 120 at least. (laughs) So we're doubling the highest end of how many reps we're getting with phonology. And to do that, we're not going to pay you know, let's say we have, you know, a speech sound, a phonology mind. Um, we try to look at all the, all the, the words that we can with that particular target with apraxia, we're going to narrow and focus, and we're going to have a very small practice set of words to maximize the amount of repetitions Mm -hmm. we get. And that are needed for true motor learning to occur of the target. And is this in a nutshell. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I mean, your work is done. That makes sense, right? <laughs> go, go out, SLPs, and, and treat this. Um, so it's is this kind of how would you think of this as muscle memory, where you're doing it so many repetitions that it just, yep. so it's similar concept. Yeah, I feel when I took prompt training, the best thing I had that they described it is like, you know, when your dogs are in the backyard and they're chasing the squirrel or they're going out to bark, they follow the same route Mm -hmm. every single time. That is what we're doing. We are carving the same route over and over and over so that they are able to access it. And what you'll see, what can be very dangerous if a therapist doesn't know what they're doing is if we don't pick, like if we're only doing that with one sound, let's say a therapist does know, okay, I need small amount of words, high practice set, lots of repetition. And then they only pick one sound or one target. That sound gets over generalized to the whole speech system. (laughs) Because <laughs> we always have to be focused on the movements of the sound and programming and planning the movements in a variety of different syllable shapes alongside different vowels and consonant combinations. So it has to be controlled or it can quickly yeah. get out of control. Yes, 100%. And, and that's exactly why phonology approaches mm-hmm. don't work. So let's say a, a therapist sees the final consonant deletion, which a child with apraxia can mm-hmm. have phonology. So they're looking at this child. This just happens. This is why it's very readily off the top of my head. Um, so they see this kid who does have a ton of phonological processes going on. They decide to ta- tackle final consonant deletion, something that's very typical. All of us would decide to tackle first. And what they did is they created a motor plan to put a final consonant on every single word after that. So even though they weren't targeting, you know, let's say a word like apple and putting a final consonant on it, they have effectively done that now for every other word because what they taught was a motor plan for a final consonant only and not contrasted it with other syllable shapes like a, you know, a VC where, or sorry, a CV where we leave it open or a VCV where we leave it open, you know. So we can't get stuck on one pattern. We can't get stuck on one sound. It's got to be on the movement sequences. Movement gestures is another term you'll hear experts use. And so if you do get stuck, then do you almost have to undo it? Oh, man. That's not fun (laughs) for anybody. (laughs) Nope. And it almost takes, no. And it almost takes longer than it would Mm -hmm. had you just done it right to get it in the first time. So that's why it's so critical to really have a good understanding of what you're doing, why you're doing it, and what the what you're trying to accomplish. Because if not, like you said, you're having to undo things. And, mm-hmm. and then I'm sure that's frustrating for everybody. Yeah. And so I think that, you know, it is kind of nice to have a podcast where you leave it open because um, in, in terms of treatment, um, because 
I think my biggest thing and why I wrote one of the reasons I wrote my book and why I try to get Mm -hmm. to college students before they graduate is because SLPs, myself included, come out of grad school, get Mm -hmm. your C's and you presume I don't anymore. I think, you know, um, (laughs) senior veteran SLPs like you and me that have been around for a little bit probably recognize that we didn't actually know every single thing there was to know from birth to geriatrics Mm -hmm. with speech, language, voice, um, swallowing, cognition, you know, like, but for some reason you come out of school, you get your sees, you're like, okay, I am the expert Mm -hmm. in the building on speech. I have to know everything related to speech and language. And we just don't know. So I think my message is please always be a lifelong learner. If you don't know what I'm talking about, or you Mm -hmm. only have a peripheral knowledge of principles of motor learning, you have to get extra training. If you expect yourself to be an effective SLP for the student or client with apraxia on your caseload, you just have to. Yeah. And will it be the same as if you're working with feeding and swallowing. You can't go in there not yes. knowing what you're doing and say, well, no, I'm just going to wing this. No. So it's it's like right. anything. If you want to, <laughs> no. I think yes. that's such a good reminder. And one more thing about the treatment piece is, as I'm sitting here thinking is the, you know, the amount of repetition and work that goes into it, how do you keep the kids motivated? Yeah. And that's a whole workshop too. <laughs> I'm just hitting them all <laughs> and the in workshops. Fact, <laughs> in the principles of motor learning, the very first one in anything is to inspire motivation. So this is hard work. Mm-hmm. This is hard work. And it's so easy to shut children down that it has to, you have to have a relationship. You have to build rapport. You can't skip those mm-hmm. steps. Skipping the steps, putting the cart before the horse will never work because you need to have the relationship. You need to develop trust. And then not only do you have trust, you have to be the one that delivers. And unfortunately, since a lot of SLPs um, just aren't skilled enough to be able to help the child, they lose Mm -hmm. that trust and the child shuts down. And, you know, that's usually a lot of times why they end up in my Mm -hmm. office. And um, it doesn't have to be that way, you know, if we just had more training in this. So, um, definitely inspire motivation. And, um, I just did, I like doing, I, I do TikToks now. Can you believe it? I don't know who I am. <laughs> I started in 2020, like the world has gone mad. Now I'm on TikTok. Um, and, uh, I just did this one though. That was like, oh no, you know, you have a client who, um, has basically been in quarantine since his whole development <laughs> from a baby to yeah. a toddler. Now he's with me at two and a half and, you know, he's not used to an office. He's not used to a new adult and, um, he only likes dinosaurs. What do you do? I bought a whole bunch of dinosaur stuff and that's where we start, you know, to, um, motivate him to just be interested, develop trust and, um, go from there. So, yeah. Well, and before we move on to the, the a couple other things we want to talk about. Um, so does your, and we will definitely, your book is awesome and I highly recommend it. Do you, um, feel like that's a good place to start also if somebody's wanting to get into this world of apraxia or has maybe started to, see some kids that they think maybe what is that, is that a good starting point it's hard to say because I feel like what my book really is, is it's going to give you the first person mm-hmm. perspective of what I saw as a parent, which is helpful for um, potential SLPs, mm-hmm. like I said, in graduate school. And then for SLPs who read it as a go-to though, or as a, as a, as a, what am I trying to say? Like as a how do yeah. how to? No, it's not going to be your okay. how to book. So it is going to direct you mm-hmm. to places on the how to. So I tried to pack it with research based, evidence based places to go, trainings to go, to get the how to, or to get any resources that you're seeking related to apraxia treatment or comorbidities. So that it does have. Um, but where I would start you out probably would be um, training such as. Um, there's a free one through childapraxiatreatment.org. It's a nonprofit that has devoted itself to just giving, well, not just, but one of their missions is to train SLPs for free with wow. CEUs. It's online in DTTC by the queen, Dr. Edith Strand. <laughs> um, <laughs> and I would like highly recommend doing a training like that. Apraxia Kids has a training every, or has a conference every year. Um, international experts come to this conference. I mean, you're going to see researchers like Dr. Tricia McCabe out of Australia there and things like that. Nancy Kaufman, who everyone is commercially very um, familiar with, but she goes to these. I mean, these are the people that you're going to see there. Um, 
And then I absolutely love the book by Carrie Ebert is her name and David Hammer, who's now retired, but they wrote a book um, like the SLP's Guide to Childhood Apraxy of Speech or something mm-hmm. like that. That one is a fabulous one. I feel like you can look at that. You can get a good idea of just, I feel like it's very, very well done. And then you'll have um, ideas to get those amount of repetitions needed to make it fun and interesting. <laughs> So you cover it all. You thought of, you thought of everything. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah, because I would think that was something where you really do need to have an engaging session. And and again, you're exactly right. That rapport is so important because this is going to be a long relationship. This is not going to yeah, be a quick relationship. Yeah. Well, um, yeah. And quickly, I know that not only do you specialize in apraxia, but you also work with children and maybe even adults. I'm not sure, but, uh, or pediatric dysarthria, dysarthria. So I guess not adults. Um, can you Mm -hmm. tell us what this is and how it's same and how is it the same and how is it different than apraxia? So apraxia is a difficulty if we're thinking about planning Mm -hmm. and programming. Again, it's all happening in the brain to start. Dysarthria is not a problem with planning and programming. It's just simply a weakness of the articulators resulting in slurred or um, more, you know, kind of imprecise Mm -hmm. speech. And then common things to go along with dysarthria might be messy eating, some dysphagia, maybe whether it's oral dysphagia, 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 however you say it, Um, (laughs) or not. Um, depending on where you're at. And so though that really is the key difference. In terms of treatment for childhood apraxia of speech in, in, in particular, um, dysarthria, can, like in Ashlyn's case, is um, a comorbidity mm-hmm. with her. And the only way it affected her treatment was that sometimes in order to get a speech sound, we had to um, teach a compensatory placement for a sound at first before we got to like a tight precision of L would be a perfect example. So, you know, getting, tensing your tongue up right under that, you know, right at that alveolar ridge for L can be hard, especially when you have dysarthria and apraxia. So compensatory placement in the medial part of the tongue at first, just, you know, if I'm going to say, let's say light, you know, we put it light. Acoustically, it sounds correct. It does not look correct. And of course, we don't want to stay there. But at least at first with dysarthria, that kind of gets us the acoustically correct until they get the hang of the motor planning with apraxia. So, yep, this is the sound we want. And now we can, you know, tense it and get it behind our teeth and kind of refine it a little bit. So, um, Sometimes kids might have volume, like I mentioned, that dysarthria is going to impact. So, um, you know, you might have to work on that. But I don't necessarily work on dysarthria without apraxia. And so um, I do feel like there's some good treatments out there. Dr. Erica Levy, if you look her up, um, I did an interview with her last summer, but she wrote an article for the ASHA Wire where she talks about treatment for dysarthria, pediatric dysarthria. But a lot of those kids, again, are going to have like cerebral Mm. palsy. So they're going to have pretty significant dysarthria needs um, that need more than just like some compensatory procedures that I'm going to do when a kid has apraxia and concomitant dysarthria. Gotcha. And would you say too that sometimes when a child has apraxia, because they're not using those articulators and those muscles frequently, that then once you have the planning in place, then you target the dysarthria because there is weakness due to not using them? Or is that not the case? So it's funny because, um, like we always joke in parent support groups online that children with apraxia are the most adorable people on the planet because yes, they have not used their articulators. So they have these little cherry yeah. cheeks <laughs> and they're plump and they're so cute. Um, but it's really because they have no muscle. Like when I look back at Ashlyn, I'm like, Oh, this is the cutest baby. Oh, it's cause she wasn't using yeah. any muscles. Um, she would have still been cute, but you know, uh, but I wouldn't say it causes dysarthria. Okay. So dysarthria it definitely will be there as a separate um, condition if it is there. But weakness might be there um, just because the articulators haven't been used. But that doesn't mean, you know, similarly, if you don't have huge biceps, your muscle isn't weak. You just haven't, mm. you know, worked out to the extent as Joe Schmo Muscle Builder has, you know, to get the muscle up. So, but it's not because you have a disorder within your muscle. That's a great way to think about it. Yeah, that's that helps a lot. And I'm wondering too with Ashlyn, does she, how does she... Do you have a hard time separating yourself sometimes from mom and the SLP or <laughs> yes? Okay. You didn't even have to think about you that. You never turn off being an SLP. You never turn it Does off. Does she get 
and because she is entering tween, um, <laughs> do you get the eye rolls, the I know mom, I don't, I mean, just, is there, do you sense that there's going to be a shift in her drawing that line that, <laughs> or does she, is she open to you, um, it's hard to say. You know, people ask me that a lot, even as parents. So as a clinician, I can say it is the norm for a child to be even a child mm. and be annoyed that you are correcting them. They want to get their message out. They don't want you interrupting them. They don't want to constantly feel like they have to um, correct themselves. They want to feel heard. Um, Ashton has always been some anomaly. Like, I don't really know, but she has always been amenable to me, always correcting her. Um, everything that she says, um, she does not mind at all. She always has a positive attitude. Um, if you follow me on Instagram, I literally say like, um, uh, like she just has this inner light that I just can't describe. It is. And so I put all the time, like, you know, keep, uh, keep going Ashton. Cause the world needs your light. Aww. Well, and you do have, I, I do love your Instagram and you do such a nice job of uh, just even professionally, but also as a parent. And I think you can't, that that's, a, that's a, giant part of who you are, um, take away the clinician, but oh, that's, yes. <laughs> and well, <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's why my handle is SLP mommy of mm -hmm. apraxia. I mean, um, I am an SLP, but mommy first. Mm -hmm. And that's like, she inspires me like every day. Yeah. It's, uh, you were meant to be together. The two of you, it sounds like <laughs> <laughs> one way, shape yeah. or form, it was going to happen. And what <laughs> advice would you give to those the to SLPs that are working with a, a child with apraxia from a parent perspective? I should say even just maybe not even just apraxia, but any diagnosis. What's What are some things that would be helpful for us to remember as, as a, from a parent's point of view? SLPs say stuff all the time <laughs> because we're on autopilot and it's our job that are really ludicrous to parents. So, I mean, I've had parents tell me before that they literally like, you know, read to that, like they've literally had an SLP in their home with children's books lined from the floor to the ceiling. And the SL just SLP's recommendation was to read. And yeah, that might be something we say. We put in our report. We don't even think about it. Make sure you're reading to your child, blah, blah, blah. And it is so insulting mm. to the parent. They're like, are you trying to imply that I don't read mm. to my child? And we don't even mean it yeah. that way. But so I think that, and so I, I relate to the SLP. I don't think anyone's trying to be condescending, mm -hmm. but recognizing what context we're giving our generalized recommendations will go a really long way. Or, you know, telling me as an SLP to an SLP, no, Knowing I'm an SLP, that my child needs a language-rich environment, you're telling an SLP that her child needs a language-rich environment. Yes, because they do need a language-rich environment. Nothing the SLP said was untrue, mm. but it comes across as condescending mm. and insulting. Yeah. Know your audience. Yeah. <laughs> like if you have a neuropsychologist in your office, which I have now as my client, and you're an SLP being like, well, you need to read to them more and, you know, provide a language rich environment. You have just insulted your neuropsychologist. Like, come on, like, let's come up with other ideas. Um, speech link. And I love, I wrote a post once called nature versus nurture. And we need to recognize as SLPs, the way we were taught in grad school, speech and language disorders are a legit disorder and they are not caused. Even if you have a family who is impoverished. Mm -hmm. It is not a speed, a true, just like I said with that muscle, a true language disorder is not caused by being in poverty. It is not caused by lack of exposure. If it's a true language disorder, does that mean that we might have low vocabulary because of lack of exposure? Of course, but then it is not a true speech and language mm -hmm. disorder. So just to keep that in mind, sorry, I got past <laughs> <it> there. <laughs> so maybe just to kind of think about like uh, our friend with the nitro coffee, stop and say, I need a moment. And before saying, yeah. and just really, yes, please and take a moment before you give those. Yeah. <laughs> and, and maybe that's, that, and that's also a good reminder too, that to get to know our families, what are they already doing? What is important to them to look at the whole picture? I know we're all busy and it's hard to it it does become probably sometimes very just, okay, go through my script. Um, 
It does. And yeah. I know that's what SLPs yeah. are doing. I know that's what they're doing, but it comes across, you lose yeah. credibility with a lot of parents and it comes across as assaulting and as insulting mm-hmm. to a lot of parents. And even to parents who quite frankly can't read because they're working three jobs, you have just added to their guilt yeah. now. <laughs> yeah. 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 So maybe instead, what would you say instead of So I always ask, what are you doing? Mm. Because regardless of what any parent, whatever situation they are in life, they're, they're all trying to Mm -hmm. do something. And so acknowledging, and then you find out what they're doing. So you don't actually give that as a recommendation. (laughs) That's huge. So what are you doing? They will tell you. And let's say it's oral oral Mm storytelling. Lots of cultures, not mine, but lots of cultures have oral storytelling that is very rich and robust. And let's say grandma's telling stories all the time, or they're Mm -hmm. with grandma and they're hearing that, you know, then you can, you you know, add to like co- capitalize on that strength mm-hmm. and be like, I think that's fantastic. Um, you know, but we want to get print awareness as well. So it sounds like you've got mm-hmm. great vocabulary and great background with that, but we want to, you know, try and add print um, awareness. And we do that by introducing some books. And in that way, you're not insulting anyone. You are, um, yeah, you are complimenting on them on what they're doing and validating them for what they are doing as parents. And then you're providing a meaningful mm-hmm. recommendation to that specific situation. No, I really like that a lot is because the, and, and then you're also coming to the table to seek information, to gain information instead of coming saying, here's all the things you're not doing that I'm going to presume that right. you're not doing. And then right. it's just that we're going to presume you're not yeah. doing this is that that's what a list looks like when we mm-hmm. have those nice little handy dandy handouts that we think are like so professional. They're not because half the things on that list, most parents mm-hmm. are doing, it comes across as very condescending. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I think that's just a great reminder for all of us is what what are you currently doing? Um, and, and maybe even yeah. just what's working from that and what's not to just, yeah. yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, definitely. That would be a good way to do it too. Take mm-hmm. a look at this list. Tell me what you're mm-hmm. doing. Tell me what's working. Tell me what, you know, yeah, that would be another great. I have not done that, but I like that idea. If you're going to mm-hmm. hand out the, you know, standard yeah. handout, you know, a basic, uh, you know, things. Yeah, no, there. see, together, we're just going to solve the... <laughs> There we go. I know. This is what's great about podcasts. This is why I like doing them, to be honest with you. So you've accomplished so much, um, just professionally, personally, and um, we're definitely going to put notes to find you and your book and SLP Mommy of Apraxia with your Instagram and your TikTok, now that you've got your, <laughs> your TikTok. So that's your handle for all your social media. But what is next for you uh, professionally? Ooh. Um, so I do want to give more workshops and travel, but I want my kids to be older. Mm-hmm. So I have the rest of my life to do that. I want to be a present mom mm-hmm. with them while they still like me and want to be around me because they're nine and 12. And so that is quickly, uh, quickly going. Um, and I know that. So I want to be as present as I can with them. Um, in terms of my private practice, um, I definitely like, I still work Saturdays and I work mm-hmm. evenings and um, it's hard. So I've been hiring people and just kind of building that up and training um, them to what I want to see and hopefully building that. So we have like a little hub here in Denver that people can come to and know they're going to get quality, um, you know, differential diagnosis or services for apraxia. And um, really beyond that right now, that's it. I want to get my kids through this. And um, then after that, like the sky's the limit. I feel like I want to go to ASHA Mm -hmm. and want to do more like that. But yeah. Yeah. Because you've got so much great knowledge and we need more of it. Do you ever take on grad students or clinical fellows? Yeah. Okay. Uh Because I could imagine (laughs) that you probably get a lot of interest because again, it's something we don't learn a lot about. So if you want to know about apraxia, you are a guru. So, (laughs) well, always a lifelong learner though. Well, I thank you so much, Laura. I have learned a ton from you and I know that others will as well. And thank you just for your passion and that you've decided to be such a wonderful clinician and advocate for your daughter and just others that have apraxia. So thank you so much for your time and expertise today. Thank you, Jennifer. And that wraps up this episode. Thank you for tuning into SLP Full Disclosure. For more information about this episode, check out the show notes on our website at medtravelers.com slash SLP Full Disclosure. And don't forget to leave us a review and subscribe so you never miss a guest. Are you interested in becoming a travel SLP? 
Visit medtravelers.com to learn more and explore the exciting opportunities we offer at top level facilities across the country. Also, a special thanks to Jonathan Carey for producing this episode and Aiden Dykes for the music and editing. And as always, this episode was powered by Med Travelers. See you next time.